Welcome to Wheeled World, uh, loyal listeners and people who turned on the podcast by accident. Welcome to another episode of High Side, Low Side. My name is Zach Quartz, and I'm joined, as always, by Spurgeon Dunbar. For those of you that are joining us by accident, you should probably know that you've stumbled <laughs> upon a motorcycle podcast where Zach and I walk you through all kinds of crazy things revolving around two wheels. Today, we're going to talk about dangers in motorcycling, perceived dangers, some bikes that get a bad reputation as being dangerous, what kind of riding situations are going to be dangerous, and... Ari Henning is going to be our guest today. That's riggedy right. So Ari is going to join us. We're going to talk about all that jazz. But first, we need to give a quick shout out to our good friends at Motul who allow us to make this lovely production. Yeah, and I think as long as we're talking about the fact that Ari Henning is going to be on the episode, we should also <laughs> be talking about the fact that Motul makes a full line of chain cleaners and lubes because we know that Ari Henning likes nothing more than a clean chain. Yeah, it's true. True fact. Um, and uh, spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about uh, that particular chain. We mentioned, I think, last time we had him on here was uh, he was talking about that BMW endurance chain that was sort of like maintenance free lifetime of the motorcycle chain. So he's got an update, very exciting update on that. Um, and uh, the reason we bring that up is that it turns out you do need to loop your chain. Yeah. After Spoiler all. alert. <laughs> uh, you you, you actually <laughs> might need to use Motul's chain cleaners and lubes, even if you have the endurance chain. So if you are out there looking for a fine way to clean your motorcycle chain, check out Motul. Um, and again, big shout out to them just in the fact that they sponsor us to talk about motorcycles. So thanks to That's them. Right. And we are now going to give away a t-shirt, I believe. Is that is that correct? I think we're going to give away two t-shirts, aren't we? Dose. We're we're on a roll here, giving away t-shirts. Um, so the first winner of a t-shirt this time around, it's a high side, low side t-shirt. It's a friendly <laughs> reminder. Um, and uh, the way that you can win a t-shirt is um, by leaving an Apple iTunes review. We know it's a pain in the tail. We've said this before. Um, but if you can take the time to, to leave your, your uh, thoughts, comments, and review on Apple iTunes, it really helps with the distribution of this show. And uh, the first person we need to call out is uh, Dante's Scorpio 007, uh, who wrote in and said um, they started listening because riding a motorcycle has been a dream, um, but they don't have any friend, friends or family who ride. Um, so signed up for their basic beginner course, wouldn't have done it without high side, low side. And uh, again, we're just suckers for flattery. And this is just so cool. We can't get over the fact that this person jumped in to, to riding motorcycles because they were inspired by um, the idiocy that this podcast represents. <laughs> so you've won a t-shirt. I uh, hope you'll wear it proudly and welcome to the two wheel club, Dante Scorpio 007. Yeah. I think the big note there is it, it, it never ceases to amaze us. I, I think we, we get a lot of feedback from people that, uh, that are big motorcyclists and they've been doing this for years, but it's always, you know, really exciting to see new people getting into it. Um, the one note that I want to make as well is in addition to winning a t-shirt, we do have these t-shirts for sale on revzilla.com. So <laughs> if you would like to, you right. can use your credit card and you can purchase yourself a high side, right. low side t-shirt. Um, but the second, for, go ahead. I was going to say for any, for everyone else, please do go to revzilla.com and look for the t-shirt to purchase for Dante's Scorpio zero zero seven you just need to send your size to high side low side at revzilla.com and your address and we'll send you a t-shirt and the other person that does not need to use their credit card to purchase a t-shirt is sb painter i like that i got the easier name on this one as always <laughs> uh sb painter writes in and says i'm an old fart that's been riding longer than these youngsters have been alive i think he's talking to you and i when he's referring to the youngsters um Sounds they like it. do have one great host who seems to know a <laughs> thing or two now he doesn't he doesn't necessarily go on to explain which one of us is the great host and which nope. one of us is not but I think we can probably just use our imagination on that one um, but he uh, <laughs> says seriously it's very entertaining very informative podcast uh, and they have binged nearly the entire collection so uh, thank you to SB Painter for keeping Zach and I guessing as to who's the good host and who's the bad host um, but you will get yourself a t-shirt <laughs> as long as you shoot us an email to highside lowside at revzilla.com give us your address and your size and we'll get it mailed right out to you. And if you know how to submit, uh, you, you you call yourself an old geezer, but if you know how to submit an Apple iTunes review, presumably you'll be able to figure out email. Um, so anyway, thank you to both of those people for the for the reviews, for the comments. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it, 
I really appreciate the compliment that I am the good host and that Spurgeon is, is not. So I, I don't think you read that correctly, that. Zach. I think we think <laughs> we're interpreting that differently. But now let's move on to a segment that we like to call In the News. So this is something that we kind of shifted for the, the beginning of season four. Um, and really the focus here is to just hit on some current events uh, that are popping up. And I do think that, you know, I, I want to start with an update. And, and Zach, I know that this is later in the list, but I'm just going to just just roll with me on this one. Um, so ready. in the last episode, we talked about a lane splitting bill that was on the desk uh, mm. of the governor in Oregon. And as soon as that episode went out, uh, the governor <laughs> had already vetoed bill by the, the bill by the time it went out. But the reason that I want to update everyone is that as of right now, because there was so, so, so much support in the, the uh, state Senate and the state House of Oregon, they can actually override the governor's veto. So it's not dead yet. We could still get lane splitting or, as it looks like, lane filtering in the state of Oregon. Very exciting. Also good to know that our old podcast isn't completely invalid already. Agreed? <laughs> I, that's the reason I want to hit this first because I, oh, yeah, sure. I can already picture all the comments of people being like, this news is out of date. Yeah, well, the news in our podcast is a lot of day. We don't the the turnaround time for these podcasts is not. It does take a couple of weeks. So when you get news on high side, low side, it is not ultra ultra fresh breaking news. But it is uh, you know stuff that's trending in the motorcycle ecosystem uh, uh, or the um, you know motorcycle society that we like to bring you. Um, the, other, the other thing we wanted to talk about was uh, a couple new bikes from Triumph. Uh, the Street Triple, sorry, Speed Triple RS. A lot of, a I lot of them, yeah. Uh, a lot of them. And then the Speed Twin. Um, and you had an interesting note about these Triumphs, uh, Spurge, when we were talking about this. So I'd like you to take it away. Yeah, and that's what I meant by a lot of them. I think really what we're seeing right now with Triumph is they're updating their entire line to meet ongoing emission standards. Uh, but what I would say is that like they don't look that different to me. And the performance doesn't seem <laughs> that drastically different than what we had yeah. previously. So especially when we're looking at something like a street triple or a speed triple RS rather, not a street triple RS, a, street, a speed triple RS, um, a speed twin. These are bikes that realistically, if you can find a leftover or used one, you're probably going to be just as happy with it uh, in a lot of cases. <laughs> yeah. To be fair, the the speed twin, I'm, I'm with you 100%. That looks like essentially the same bike. And I don't really know what they would update on it anyway. It's sort of like the parts bin thing where they took like, uh, the engine from the Thrux and R and they put it in the, the sort of Bonnie chassis and it has a whatever. Very cool bike. Love that bike. Um, the, the speed triple though, uh, our colleague Jen reviewed that bike. They did, they did go through that with a, a finer tooth comb and they did add horsepower and I think reduce some weight and, um, add some electronics. And they tried to, to bring it up to, to date with, um, the, the sort of heavy hitters in the uh, super naked category, which are hit very heavily. I think we can agree these yeah, days. No, that's that's valid. I think I think I was looking at my notes here, and I have my notes for the Speed Twin as a, like a loose update. But I I do I do want to retract my previous statement because you are right. They they were claiming <laughs> that that was now going to be like the top dog in the uh, the naked segment. They were making some bold claims, if I remember correctly, about that bike. Yeah, it was something about like on par with which I, I think we uh, uh, Jen's review revealed that it's maybe still not quite as viciously fast as some of the other um, hyper nakeds from. Um, or super nakeds from Europe, but a cool update nonetheless. The point is about all this. Spurgeon's right in so much as uh, um, companies are going to have to pivot to uh, to meet the the growing need to to um, keep up with emission standards. And so, in, in a lot of cases, you're going to see 2022, 2023 bikes that are maybe not as new as you were expecting. Um, which is good for the used market. I well, I, I think that takes us right into another news topic um, regarding the emissions laws in the state of California specifically. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how many of you out there read Jen's article. Jen did a great job. Um, she had interviewed people from the California Off-Road Vehicle Association, the AMA. She interviewed local dealerships because there are some changes in the laws around dirt bikes for the state of California. Um, basically, the red sticker laws are going away and they're ushering in a whole new era of emissions regulations, Zach? I mean, it's basically just going to get a lot more restrictive to try to use um, off-road bikes in off-road areas. And and for some people around the country, Jen and I talked about this, and for some people around the country, it doesn't matter that much <laughs> because uh, she and I are from New England and um, there aren't really places like there are in California. Like, it, you know, we both rode off-road a little bit in Massachusetts, but if you're going to do that, you have to go to a 
park. I mean, you have to go to basically like an off-road riding park or a motocross track or something like that in order to ride bikes. Like there's, there, there aren't as many of these kind of not gray area, but sort of like BLM, you know, Bureau of Land Management places where it's just sort of like, yeah, you can ride the bike as long as it has a spark rest or as long as it has these, um, these qualifications from a mechanical standpoint in California though. And especially other places in the, in the wild west here, um, uh, there are, this, this has potential to have a massive impact because there are lots of people that ride bikes that are not street legal, but they are legal to be ridden out in the, <laughs> sort op- of, the open wilderness, right? The desert. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so taking that away is going to, you know, it's going to make people either say, well, the heck with it. I'm just going to ride my motocross bike out, out on these public lands regardless and just say to hell with it. Or I have to, I have to jump through all these hoops to make, to make sure that I'm, that I'm legal. And I'm, and, and, and the manufacturers have had, she makes a good point in her article about how the manufacturers have had 20, 30 years, maybe to, to come around, to build to these specifications, but they didn't because it was easier to go, you know, they took, they took the easy road and now the, you know, the, the, um, consumer the government's cracked down yeah. on it and well, the consumers are going to suffer potentially, which is a bummer. I, I, so here's the deal. Like in, I live in Pennsylvania and we ride either in New Jersey or PA and other than private land, we have nowhere here to ride. It's very similar to what you're talking about in the Northeast. However, if we have a plated dirt bike, like I have a 350 EXCF and Jen was right. actually just out here um, a week ago and we went riding and we have a spare office 350 EXCF it has a license plate. So I can go ride in New Jersey. I can go ride at Bald Eagle State Forest in PA and I can promise you that my 350 is not lacking in performance whatsoever. So I, I do think that, you know, really what you're going to see is probably a, an adaptation of people buying dirt bikes that meet emission standards. Now, I think the problem is, like you said, there's not a current huge crop of them within within OEM's lineups. So I think they're probably going to have to change some of that around. Right. right. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's a, it's a great article. It can be found on common tread. Um, it's, it's worth the read if you're, if you're interested or if you, you know, even if you think it affects you. <laughs> when are we going to get you um, out here to ride dirt bikes with us? I don't pro- know, man. You've been, you've been promising I, that you're going to come out and ride dirt bikes with us for a while. Oh, I, went out and I, bought, is, I bought a 350 for you to ride real, and you still haven't come out. That's a real backhand. There was that whole, um, God, I forget. It's been so long now. What was it called? Coronavirus thing? I don't remember. <laughs> anyway, it was a thing that happened and we like, weren't supposed Jen. to get on airplanes or whatever. I know. Well, I mean, I was, I, Ari and I were hired a year before she was and I know. she's out there riding dirt bikes. When we got hired, you were like, oh, Zach and Ari, you guys are going to come out. We're going to ride the Pine Barrens in Pennsylvania. It's going to be so much fun. And then pff, nothing. You know, and, we didn't and you get, never showed you know, up. And now Jen, I mean, Jen flies out once, once a month just to hang out with us here. My God, she just really hang does out. care. Yeah, she yeah. wants to be a team player. Right, right, right. <laughs> Speaking of, I don't, I don't know, apropos of nothing. Yeah, how, yeah, uh, another so how thing do you we transition wanted. that in there? <laughs> um, apropos, absolutely nothing. Um, one of the last update we want to talk about in the news is the 2022 Honda Grom. Um, there is a first ride article written by our friend Mark Gardner on uh, the common tread section of Razilla.com as usual. Um, but this is kind of exciting. The Grom's obviously a, been a success for Honda. It's a rad little bike. And um and yeah, Mark's article does a good job breaking down how it has improved and what the evolution looks like. Not least of which, uh, a fifth gear, which is pretty exciting. Five now. You got a five-speed <laughs> transmission in the Honogram. I just don't like the styling. Like I put a note in in, in Mark's article, um, but I they, they have like the little grommets. Uh, no pun intended, but there's like little grommets on the side of the tank now. But it looks like right, it right. reminds me of those those bullet hole stickers that people used to put on their cars in like the 2000s. <laughs> and it just that's all i can picture when i see those and it does not look appealing to me whatsoever so uh, how yeah. how hard are you oh, my grom's got bullet holes in it that's how hard i am all right well anyway so, um let's a fun, do a let's, fun let, update and i would say let's do this so I, I know that this is technically not worldwide news but you and ari just released an episode of uh ctxp common tread experience in which you guys rebuilt or recreated the dumb and dumber mini bike and you tested it in this kind of fashion of seeing whether or not you could actually ride it across nebraska so let's let's count that as a news article let's pull ari on here and let's just talk about that for a minute we are the news today everybody all right so we are back with mr ari sorry i was <laughs> Come on, Spurgeon. Don't you know my name? Mr. Say, Harry friends, Enning. We've been friends for like six years. <laughs> probably going to call oh. me Ari. All right. So we're back with Mr. Ari Henning. <laughs> um, 
we uh, we might as well just roll right into that, and we can let the audience see my faux pas. Um, so <laughs> I, I I did want to start off by just asking the two of you. So we kind of left off with a bit of a teaser. Um, you guys just got back uh, from recording an episode where you reenacted the Dumb and Dumber mini bike scene. And I kind of want to get a little bit of a behind the scenes from the two of you. What was that like? To, what was that like to do? What was it like to put the bike together and go out and ride and have the two of you, you know, two up on on this little mini bike across the country? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't even know where to start. Where, where yeah, do we start know, with that, Zach? It's, it's a lot to uh, unpack, Spurgeon. Yeah, there, I mean, it, it started with building a bike, which well, will be. Uh, it started with we wanted to ride a Polestar bike, but we realized we were going to have to modify it to fit two people. So Zach and I actually just went full zoot and built one from the ground up essentially like custom chassis custom all sorts of stuff so we have an exact replica of the one from the movie we do which we which we slash revzilla now owns you're welcome revzilla and um that'll be a shop manual episode i'm not exa- yep, exactly yep. sure when this podcast releases and when that shop manual comes out but um it will be a shop manual episode that you can find now if not soon and then, um, and then we rode, uh, we spooned basically on a tiny little motorcycle and rode all the way from Nebraska to Colorado. Yeah. And you do have a license, it, it, you have a license plate on it, right? Like you managed to get this like yeah. street legal. Took it to Arizona, the lawless, lawless <laughs> state where they reluctantly gave us a, a sign to VIN and gave us a license plate. So then my, my final question is like when you were at the actual riding aspect of this, what was the weather like? What was it like? You know, I mean, you're trundling along on the highway basically on a bike that had a top speed of 45-ish miles Thir- an hour? 32, 32? 33. It was yeah. carrying carrying two guys on it, and we had it geared pretty low <laughs> so we'd be able to get up the Rockies. It was uh, it was pretty monotonous and very vibey and very stinky. And uh, yep. it there, was, was, there was a jetting change. It was super fun. There was a jetting change that took place. The seat was very uncomfortable. Um, we, we cleared uh, a 10,000-foot pass in the Rockies yep. at one point before – um you know uh yeah so it was it was it was as brutal i think um or just about as brutal as harry and lloyd make it look in the in the movie um so you could argue that it was a pretty special experience to actually do it and as as trying as it was like it was awesome to do like what a bucket list thing to be like oh yeah as part of my lifelong motorcycling experience i've ridden a mini bike two up from nebraska to aspen you know like in that movie yeah so and it's not good it, it's not like it's it's not like uh a lot of stuff we do in ctxp deserves a big pat on the back this this included we don't see yeah. ourselves as you know whatever and any kind of like breaking any new ground but it is kind of fun to think about the fact that we might be the only people who have, have actually, actually done it done, yeah like because they didn't when they do shot it in the, the movie. movie yeah exactly so yeah. i don't know we got a kick out of that it was it was fun and the bike that, made that, the journey yeah, was, so like now now we have that, a replica that, of the that bike that part. actually did it I would say that was my question was like if this was a Mythbusters episode you guys you guys busted the myth right like you can actually do it as long as as long as they carried three extra tires <laughs> is that how yeah. many you went through it, we went through two, rear two tires and a half. yeah yeah crazy they're like these these little five inch uh, lawn tractor tires that you can get at the tractor supply store for $19 they're not really rated for uh you know highway use for well, uh I think 400 pounds of man meat as Ari put it <laughs> yeah the the weight rating that's actually inscribed on the sidewall of the tire is not a number I'm going to mention here. <laughs> Unpublishable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if you guys, if, if those of you out there watching this haven't seen the episode yet, it is live on Revzilla's YouTube channel. Um, you should go check out uh, Ari and Zach as they reenact Harry and Lloyd and they ride a mini bike to Aspen, Colorado. California. Beautiful. California. <laughs> anyway, um, Another thing that we that we want to talk about, uh, apropos of the news segment that we mentioned, you and Ari, is the update on the uh, endurance chain from BMW, which oh, you yeah. went through uh, quite a rigmarole to get it tested. Yeah, I mean, I didn't actually have to do anything other than request my friend Paul Pellin uh, do what he does, <laughs> which is ride a lot. Paul Paul is trying to stack a million miles for MS, um, and the guy racks like five to ten thousand miles a month, so he put one on his Tenere seven hundred or his T seven and rode it around. Um, and after just 12,000 miles, it was, uh, it was junk. So the no maintenance life chain is unfortunately snake oil, uh, which I'm <laughs> pretty disappointed and surprised by because BMW of all companies, you expect to really like put some effort into the R and D. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it didn't hold up. So didn't hold up in the real world. Just so, just so the audience is clear as to what we're talking about. This is a $450 chain that BMW created. Uh, it's like, 
I think it's like 385, 35. and it's made in in uh, collaboration with Regina, and it's supposed to have this TAC coating on the bushings and rollers, oddly, which doesn't make any sense to me because the rollers aren't really a wear item. Um, <laughs> but it's it's a diamond-like coating that's supposed to also serve as a dry lubricant, and they claim they claimed at the time that they introduced it that it was no maintenance and lifetime. So no one knows what lifetime means. When I asked them, they said results will vary, but they have now walked that back, and they're saying low maintenance chain. Uh, and it is only approved for a few models, so I think it was a it was an experiment that they tried and maybe didn't um, put enough testing into, and uh, the testing that has happened has not been super successful. So Paul yeah. was in here just earlier this week, and he dropped off the chain, so I'm going to disassemble it and do an autopsy, so I'll measure the pins and bushing ID and all that stuff. And your yeah. friend Paul, his call handle is Long Haul Paul, right? Long Haul Paul, yep. He's on Instagram, Twitter. He's got a, a website. He's been doing it for nine years. He's logged, I don't know, I think he said close to half a million miles at this point. He he rode from New Hampshire to Los Angeles to give the chain to Aerie. In, in three days. Yeah. And then he, he turned just, around the same day and rode back. <laughs> He's nuts. He's absolutely yeah, insane. We were, he, so he, he, was, was, he was with me at the Tenere 700 launch, so that bike that he has now. Uh, we were down there, and I remember waking up the morning that we were supposed to leave, and I had driven down in a truck because I had to bring the bike back with me. Paul came down on some other Yamaha model, left it there, and then rode that back to New Hampshire, except for, like, it rained the whole way. So we left in the morning, and, like, I got in my truck, and I'm watching him, like, get geared up, and it's, like, just, it was a torrential downpour, and I rode the entire way back to Pennsylvania in the rain, so I'm guessing he did the same thing, but he was on that, that Tenere 700. Plus yep. going a little farther, you know, up to New Hampshire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there will be a, I'll, I'll have a, with Paula's help, um, we'll have a full review of that chain with information and feedback from BMW um, on, on Common Tread at some point in the future. Last thing to clarify about the chain taking a dump at 12,000 miles is that um, the, uh, Paul rightly pointed out, correct me if I'm wrong, Harry, but the stock Tenere chain, he said he got a T7 chain, he got 20,000 w- with lube and maintenance, right? Yeah, and that's what Spurgeon says he got, and plenty of people get 20,000 yeah. miles out of a standard DID right. or whatever chain. It just requires a little bit of maintenance, which, yeah. you know, not everyone which, likes to do. But which you should take pride in, right, Harry? I certainly think so, of course. <laughs> yeah. But I do think, I think it's interesting because, like, so many people in our common dread articles, they'll make comments about how difficult it is, and it's, oh, maintaining a chain is so hard, and it's really not. Like, it's it takes, you know, every 500 miles, get down there and clean it off and wipe it and lube it, and you're, you're good to go, and you can get 20,000 miles out of it, and you don't have to spend uh, $385. Yep, yep. True enough. So, on the topic of chains that could break and cause an accident... Today we're talking about the dangers of motorcycling, which is obviously a very broad topic, um, but we do want to just lay a couple of um, um, sort of ground rules today to let you know how this discussion is going to work. First and foremost, um, we're not including uh, data or studies or stuff like that. This isn't about comparing statistics. Um, it's more anecdotal and, and our experience in motorcycling um, and what we've learned over the years uh, as far as where where you find the the safest avenue to explore motorcycling and where you might um get hurt <laughs> so so based on our personal experience not not like a hurt report or anything like that exactly correct yep yeah yeah um so, so purely uh, scientific area is what we're getting <laughs> exactly purely experiential purely so anecdotal. we're gonna start off with pavement riding um i think that's that's something that the three of us are the most familiar with so i think that sort of makes sense um and i think that the a good way to kick it off uh, to begin with is sort of this very broad topic of street riding versus track riding. Um, and I guess I'm going to, I'm going to go guest honors and I'm going to give Ari the first word. Someone said street riding versus track riding. What is safer? What would your answer be, Ari? I mean, my knee jerk reaction would be the street because never mind. That was totally, that was totally wrong. My knee jerk reaction. <laughs> <laughs> My knee-jerk reaction would be the track because it's a closed course. It's a controlled environment. You're wearing the proper gear. Um, right. I think there are caveats to that, obviously. The way I like to ride at the racetrack is on the ragged <laughs> edge, and I've certainly crashed far more times at the track than I ever have on the street. But, um, you know, the vast majority of those you literally walk away from because it's the track, and it's just a safer environment. There's no curbs to hit. There's no cars. There's no stop signs, telephone poles. There's an ambulance there. Uh, but I think there's a lot to unpack there, so uh, I'm yeah. keen to talk about it. What about you, Spurge? Is that your same your no, same so reaction? I think that the track is a tool that you can use to improve on street riding. But I've also gone to the track with people that were uh, so terrified about being on a racetrack that like it ended up being more dangerous than 
they're they're riding on the street. So I, I, I think that I think the racetrack can be a tool to make you a better rider, to be safer. Um, but I don't necessarily know if, you know, especially if you're talking to somebody that's a beginner that's just starting out. I don't know if jumping on a racetrack is necessarily the the safest way, the way that I see it. Really? So you think being on a street where there's cross traffic and dogs and sandy corners and potential oil spills and like the track is that they go out every morning and they check it. Like the rider might be scared, but the environment itself is certainly safer than the street. I don't think it's safer than the street if they're so intimidated by the speed of other people blowing by them and they can't just pull over and they can't just catch their bearings. They have to know all the rules and the regulations. I just think that that can be as intimidating for some people as you know, cross town traffic. Mm. Um, you know, so I think for me, like I'm not advocating that someone should go out and jump on the freeway, <laughs> the 405. Um, but I am saying that if you have a, a small, quiet street that, you know, going back and forth down your, your street and getting your bearings is probably a bit more of a more comfortable environment. Maybe not as controlled as racetrack, but yeah. you know, more comfortable. So that's, right. but that's, so it sounds like you're talking about people who are very early in their riding careers with not a lot of experience. I, yeah, I think, it, I, I guess that's where my mind went. Um, but I guess, you know, even for people that I know, uh, we, we did a track day uh, the one time and we had someone out with us that had been riding for quite a few years on the street, but the track was so intimidating that it, it really did make them uncomfortable. It just was, it wasn't the right environment for them. Um, Sounds like they just need a good pep talk beforehand. Yeah. Let them know that it's not it's, their responsibility to worry about how people pass them, that there are rules that aren't very complicated and that there's measures there to keep them safe. I think, I it think sounds that's a great, like, a great it point. It sounds like the... I think it sounds like the person that they were with, like maybe Spurgeon, what didn't do a good job explaining. Didn't chaperone that person. This, yeah, is, exactly. this is coming from the Hayabusa story guy that uh, went out and <laughs> led his buddy around a track and then ran him off the road. So I, so I, I can, I can, I can hear that. I do think that my only point in this is that while I think we're all comfortable with the track and how it works, and even if you give somebody a pep talk, it's it can be intimidating when you're lining up even on the beginner circuit, you know, at a track day right. to to just kind of soak all that sure. in. I think I think the upshot here is that we know that a controlled environment is a better place to experiment with the control of a motorcycle. But if you don't know that, then you need someone to tell you and encourage you exactly. to to experience that environment. So I I get what you're saying, Spurge, that it can be a, a, a an intimidating place to go to go to a racetrack um, and and try to ride around with people and you think you'd be in the way or you, like you don't know the etiquette that kind of stuff. Um, you've got the you've got the deciding vote here, Zach. So <laughs> well, what I would say is that yeah, like I said, I think we we know I think we know the the answer here, which is that it 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 really is safer to not have all of those other variables involved with your riding. So if you were listening to this and you're thinking, well, I'd never go to a, tra a track day because I'm not trying to race and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put myself in a, in a place where like it's competitive. That's not, I'm, I'm not interested in that. Just know that if you're feeling any of those pressures to a certain extent, they are unfounded. You should be mm -hmm. able to go and experience a track day without feeling yeah. those pressures. The, the beginner group, the C group is typically, got uh rules about passing yeah. where it's not allowed or it's only allowed on the straightaway so you don't have right. to worry about people blazing by you and you know it's very very controlled and you never have to worry about anyone turning left in front of you which is yes, a very which very is... common reason that people get hurt or killed on the street absolutely so i a couple things i want to i want to unpack here like you said Ari. one what is it so you said you like to ride on the ragged edge of the track because i think uh, your data in your life area and mine i think also if people said what's safer street or the track, I would say riding on a track. And then they, if they said, how have you hurt yourself more? I would say riding on a track a hundred percent. So yep. is it just an attitude thing? What's the, I'd say so. I think if you take someone like, like Lance Oliver, our esteemed editor, like he goes to the racetrack to ride at a moderately fast pace. Whereas guys like you and me, Zach and Spurgeon, probably you to some degree as well. Like you really enjoy exercising everything that you're capable of and hopefully everything the bike's capable of. And you know, you do that in the controlled environment of the track because occasionally things go wrong. It's basically you're practicing and when you practice, you're going to get it wrong occasionally. Whereas on the street, I would absolutely never, uh, walk that close to the edge i leave such a huge margin so the speed that i really enjoy the speed that gives me a thrill i would never even dream of doing that on the street it would just be so ungodly sa unsafe whereas on the right. track it is safe yeah i yeah, would say yeah, that's a i, I was that's gonna a say good. i would probably put myself somewhere between uh you and zach and then lance oliver i'm probably like in the middle of that um and i say that being I've been to a track day with you, Ari, and I've been to a track day with Lance, and I would definitely say I'm in the middle of those two. But <laughs> but to your point, I, I think maybe this goes back to where I was talking about in the street, because when I'm on the track, I'm there to practice, 
And I'm also there to push the envelope a little bit beyond what I normally feel comfortable with. And I, I look at it as a learning experience, but when I'm riding on the street, I dial it back quite a bit and I'm not riding anywhere near the edge. So I think for me, that goes back to where I was talking about earlier with street riding where yes, you have these other obstacles, but I haven't turned the volume up so much on my mm -hmm. riding that I'm pushing that edge. So, yeah, so it sense. seems like a lot of this really depends on the attitude of the rider, which brings, brings up a lot of things that the riders can do in terms of their mentality and their approach to riding that can increase safety. Certainly. And I, I think that your, your point about the, the racetrack being a sort of sandbox where you can, you know, play, you can experiment with things that you would never do in an environment is unsafe is that inherently explains the fact that you believe that it's safer. <laughs> to Absolutely, do those yeah. things there right again um, it's just the it's the the reduction in um variables that that are beyond your control right so, so what's what's a what's a uh, keep keep going with that uh, attitude discussion that you just kicked off Harry. um in terms of the track you can you can not ride as aggressively as perhaps you or i do and you can just enjoy getting to hold your motorcycle at wide open throttle and potentially dragging your knee in which case i think it's extremely safe because you're just you're not flirting with the edges of traction and you're not riding uh, at the edge of your ability um and then in terms of of the street i think we've agreed that it's sort of a different mentality in general although i think we've all seen plenty of people who treat the street as a racetrack which i think yeah. is a terrible idea and is just right. a recipe for disaster I had a we've, question for we've, Zach. Um, yeah. So, so Ari had made the comment about. So, I, I I agree with what Ari just said as far as like we should probably have a separate part of this where we talk about like riding track level pace on the streets probably not the best idea. But so Ari likes to ride on the fringe, and he's kind of insinuated that that's how you ride at the track too. Would you agree with that? Do you find yourself trying to always push the edge, or can you go to a track day and just kind of ride middle of the pack? Uh, I I. I think Aerie is better at riding at the edge. <laughs> I think he, I think he, he approaches it. Uh, he's just more comfortable than I am there. But the, the short answer to your question is yes, that's how I ride at the track. Like I don't, I don't, I absolutely, I want the traction control light turning on when I'm coming out of corners yeah. and I want, and if you're like, not spooling I, the tire up at some point, then you're not particularly satisfied. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely going like, I'm going as fast as I can. And I'm understanding that that's, the place to do it right like i get my kicks there i like i like going into corners at the racetrack and thinking like oh this might not work <laughs> this really might not work and it's a really scary place to be in that moment to be slowing down as hard as you can and see a corner coming and think i don't think i'm going to make this but it it just it's another arrow in your quiver when you go to ride on the street you know like that's that's i, I get a thrill out of that because i love racing and i i used to be a racer i suppose but i but i also I also understand that it has value to, to, and, to my sort of toolbox. And to be clear, like, you know, I don't think Zach or I want to ride recklessly, like riding on the ragged edge does not mean riding recklessly. It simply means like stepping closer to what you're actually capable of and hopefully learning to be more capable, but it's not, you don't just barrel into a corner being like, well, I hope I make it. I'm at the track. So who cares? Like we don't, we don't, we don't ride like that unless we're on Sierra fifties. And then we probably but, do. But ride I, th like yeah, I think that's, a, that's a probably a good explanation for the audience is like, uh, because you are talking about, you've got the skill and really what you're doing, even if, even if you're flying into the corner and you're not sure if you're going to make it, you have the skill to, to navigate through the corner. You're just, you know, pushing that skill level. Yeah. yeah. You're, it, you're flirting with what you've experienced before and what you're comfortable with. Yeah. Um, so to, to pivot a little bit, I had one question I had written down for both of you is, um, you know, we, we talked about the, the, the value of, of riding the track and kind of the fact that we agree that, that a closed environment is safer, which I feel like is probably pretty easy for the listeners to understand. But to pivot a little bit, what do you think the most dangerous aspect of riding on the street is? Um, I don't know, whoever, whichever one feels ready to answer can go first. Uh, everyone else. Every other, every other thing. Whether it's a dog running in the street or, yeah, you, I don't, I don't feel that the rider. It's the things that you can't control. It's the, it's the cross traffic. It's the squirrels. It's the debris <laughs> blowing across the road. It's the transmission leak that you can't see in a corner. It's the fluid leaking out of the back of a trash truck. It's just so many things that, that, yeah, you're, you don't have any, any ability to predict or, or control. See, I disagree with that. Like, I, I think too often motorcyclists... He likes that. trash truck fluid. No, I, I just, I think too many riders... <laughs> Such a use, strong smell. 
<laughs> I think too many riders use that as an excuse. I think that the most dangerous thing about riding on the street is individuals not paying attention and not taking it seriously. Like, I get that there's always a freak accident. There's always, you know, the, the deer that could jump out in front of you. Um, you know, Jen was just out here riding dirt bikes, and she'll tell you the story where we were coming up this one trail, and a deer was literally a foot in front of me across the trail, and it scared the, the hell out of me. But... I think for the majority of obstacles that we encounter on the street, if you are a uh, attentive motorcyclist, there's a lot of that that you can avoid. And I think too often motorcyclists blame other people mm. or other obstacles when it's really a responsibility for you to be a, mm -hmm. a, an aware rider. Absolutely. And to, to be clear that that was, that was assumed in my scenario. My assumption is that you're wearing all the right gear You've got the brakes covered. You know how to counter steer. You know how to emergency brake. You are dialed in and paying attention. Still, there's things that like you just can't stop someone from blowing a stop sign. And I don't care how good you are at counter steering. Sure. Like, you're not going to steer your way out of that. No, I, I agree yeah. with that. I, and I, there's always the outlier. But I do think that like we should probably yeah. make sure that we, we say we have to put some accountability and onus Absolutely. back on us. There's a tre yeah, yeah. tremendous amount of responsibility. And to that point, I would say like knowing how to emergency brake and knowing how to use counter steering and obviously having your wits about you. Like the fellows that you see splitting lanes here in California who are bobbing their head as they listen to music with one hand on the tank as they swerve through traffic, that is not a safe way to ride on the street. And there's a lot <laughs> yeah. of examples of, of that out there. So I think there's also a lot of examples of what people can do to, to actually prepare themselves for survival. So yeah. what would you the, say, Zach? The, well, I was just going to say the accountability thing is, is huge. And I think I, uh, I, if memory serves, I wrote an article about this, although it's, it's all a blur at this point, but it's really, to Ari's point, uh, it's really easy to, um, to say that, that, that those are the, are the, are the least safe things in riding on the street is all the, all the variables because on the surface, that is absolutely true. But if you're not if you're not holding yourself accountable for every mistake that you make, then you're also, to your points, Virgin, you're not contributing to that. Exactly. You're, 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 you're only hurting yourself. And there are lots of people, I mean, we, we've, we've probably all had these discussions with people where they say like, Oh, like I, I had to lay it down or like that person, you know, they pulled in front of me or like, you know, the, the a car pulled out and there was nothing I could do. And you think like yeah, in certain circumstances, yeah, there, like maybe there was nothing you could do, but there are also other circumstances where you think like, I wonder if someone who was a better rider just would have seen that and yeah. they would have gotten on the brakes or they wouldn't have thought like, oh, that person's not going to pull out in front of me. I'll just keep going. Like, I don't, I'm not going to cover the brakes. I'm not going to slow down or whatever. And then they get bit by that situation. And it's, it is someone who there, there's a transgression that took place. Like there's an antagonist in the situation, but you could have avoided it if you were, yeah. if, if you were, were more diligent, paying attention, which is important to remember for so sure. I have a, I Certainly. have a question for this. Cause we're all getting, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to cut us all down here. Cause we're all getting a little bit preachy. So what, so <laughs> like in, in a, uh, do as I say, not as I do moment here, what's, what's one of your biggest mistakes that you've made, whether it's on the track or the street, like let's, let's just humble ourselves for the audience for a second. What mistakes have you guys made? Hmm. Sure. Who wants to go first? I got quite a few. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, yeah, go ahead, Ari. Uh, my, my mistake list for the racetrack is it, it far outweighs my mistake list for the street because, as I said, <laughs> uh, those are two different approaches. But uh, my worst street incident was actually getting rear-ended, which is easy to say wasn't my fault, except I have adapted uh, strategies since that incident that will hopefully prevent or at least diminish that in, in the future, which is that any time I break hard on the street – the first thing I do is check my mirror to make sure the person behind me is hopefully slowing down as well. Because the incident that occurred to me is I didn't, I paid attention to what was going on in front of me. I didn't pay attention to what was going on behind me. And I could have very easily moved out of the way under the shoulder and avoid getting punted on the 405 or the 10 freeway in Santa Monica. Um, so that I learned something from it, which is super important. Um, and I guess I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't think of that before. So I'm, I'm keen to advise others listening to this that bear in mind that your motorcycle probably slows down a lot better than automobiles and because it's lighter and the people behind you might not be paying attention. So if you brake hard, check your mirrors quickly to make sure the people behind you are, are aware of what's going on. Yeah. That's, that, I, I like that one a lot. I think that I think that goes, <laughs> that goes back to our personal accountability conversation that we just had, right? Like that would be an easy one for you to blame on someone else, but it, it sounds like you, you learned something from it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a double-edged sword with the whole slowing down thing, because I think, I, th I think actually cars have a capability to slow down faster than motorcycles do, but 
that doesn't mean they will. And it also, yeah. it, it, it's, it's a double-edged sword in so much as if someone in front of you slams on their brakes at the same time you slam on their brakes, you might not be able to stop. So giving them that distance is super important. And to Aries' point, it doesn't matter what the capability of the vehicle is if the person's looking at their phone behind you <laughs> and <Exactly>. you're not <laughs> prepared for that. Um, I guess my, I mean, the, the thing that popped in my head first, and Aries actually, Aries watched me make plenty of mistakes riding motorcycles. So um, perhaps he can chime in here. But the one that comes to mind for me is, I've had instances where I've crossed the double yellow line by accident. Um, and um, yeah, I don't, I, 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 I'm trying to think of a specific instance where like it was, com- be- it was really my fault, but like, I know that I've done it where I've, I've been riding on a twisty road and I'm like enjoying it a little bit too much. And I just sort of like, ah, oh, and then, and then I just drift over the, the double yellow line on the exit of a corner and you think like, oh shoot. And there's no car and it doesn't matter. But those but it is Russian roulette. Yeah. A hundred percent because you can't, you, you're not in control of what the next corner will look like. And every time you make one of those mistakes, it's extremely important to recognize within yourself. Like there could have been a car coming. And actually one time when Ari and I were riding together, I was riding a sidecar and there was a car was coming a car the other coming. way. Yeah. Um, and I avoided a head on collision by the skin of my teeth. But you, but um, you pour a, tore a tire off a rim using the cylinder of a Ural. I did. I did. Um, <laughs> And, wait, 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 and, wait, wait, what happened? You can't just say that and not uh, explain it. Yeah. Grazed the side of, I believe it was an Oldsmobile, like a, yeah. like an iceberg against the Titanic's hull <laughs> and took the rim, <sighs> took the tire off the rim, like punched it off the rim to a degree that it went flat. And, uh, it all, the Ural, the Ural I, was fine. In all the years of us <laughs> telling stories, how have I not heard this one yet? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so it was a it was a it was a decreasing radius corner, and I was riding a sidecar. And when you go through a decreasing right, radius right hand corner on a sidecar, uh, it's very easy to get caught out because you have to turn tighter. And if you haven't set your speed properly, the sidecar lifts up, and you are uh, <laughs> you're just boned if you if you have not calculated your speed correctly. It's one of the things that make sidecars quite dangerous, frankly. Um, and I I didn't I didn't calculate that correctly. Um, and yeah, I, I, I went into the corner and I like couldn't slow down enough. Um, and I drifted over to the other lane and the, the stoner kid driving that Oldsmobile luckily was paying enough attention that he moved over as much as he could, but it was a bridge. So there was yep. no shoulder and he couldn't move over anymore and he couldn't stop. And I, yeah, I, I put that left-hand cylinder, that Ural all the way down that Oldsmobile. And I like, I, I creased the rear passenger door and I blew the rear tire out of his car and, and the, uh, the driver's biggest concern was I've got a frozen pizza I really need to get home and get in the oven <laughs> yeah it seemed like he did not like he, he, did, he was not concerned about the car <laughs> no he was just sort of like oh man I'm supposed to meet my brother we were gonna do a couple bong rips and have this pizza um so he was a he was a cool customer to hit the point is <laughs> yeah, um, what's the point <laughs> yeah what was the point again? no the point is making mistakes on a motorcycle which is uh it can can easily happen and it's I think I'm not sure if this is where you're going with the story or your, your question Spurgeon but um, you know, holding yourself accountable for that is super important because if you either always blame someone else or you think like, oh, whatever, like I, I like I went into the other lane, but like there was no car, so no big deal. Then you're setting yourself up for disaster later. I had, so no, you I, a- I had no agenda other than to try and get a, a, a story out of us to make the audience feel right, good, and I think right, you right. running over an Oldsmobile probably did it. So, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so do you you must have a a, a tale of. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think I think it's interesting. So uh, Zach and I were at uh, FZ10 launch together uh, years ago down at down at Deals Gap, and I think that's one of the areas where you see it a lot, where people cross over the double yellow, and it gets really treacherous because oh, it's yeah. so back and forth. But I think for me, mine, and I think we all have our track examples, right? Like we could all probably give a, a, a litany of things that we've done wrong at the racetrack. But my example of street riding is actually parking lot behavior. So I was uh, in a parking lot early on and I just kind of like stopped and I wasn't paying attention and I was just in the middle of the parking lot um, and I forget it was before like even I had a cell phone so it wasn't even that like I was doing something and I wasn't paying attention and a car backed into me and that's an Mm. example of like it backed into me and it almost rolled over top of me because it backed into me didn't see me didn't feel me didn't feel itself hitting me um, what and and like finally I was like whoa 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 and he he got, got his attention but that would be one where like I would easily put the blame on myself. If I would have been paying attention, I wouldn't have been sitting in the middle of a parking lot 
uh, I wouldn't have uh, been sitting in the middle of the parking lot without the bike in gear and, and pulling away. Or if I would have seen this person yep. backing out, could've I honked. I could have I could have honked. I could have you know paid attention and gotten away. So I think that was right. one for me of like really even if I feel like oh I've, I pulled into the parking lot, I'm checking the map. Um, I think is probably what I was doing. I should have pulled into a parking spot or I should have made sure that I was out of the way of traffic. So that would be probably just a really dumb mistake that, that I've done in the past. Yeah. yeah. You know where that's you know where that's not gonna happen, Spurgeon? The racetrack. Unless the racetrack. I were to pull over in the middle of the straightaway <laughs> and like, you know, check oh. my, my lap times and then just have people <laughs> whipping by me. True enough. Um well yeah, I, I think that um that that was a good question, Spurge, and I think it's definitely very fair to reflect on that stuff as we talk about this because it's a I think it's a super important exercise for all yeah, of us to nobody's take part nobody's in. above it, and I think as riders, yeah. I think it's very common to overestimate your your skills and your experience and get a little bit of hubris when it comes to that. So yeah. I appreciate Spurge and you knocking us all down a peg and being like, <laughs> yeah, we've we've made our own mistakes, and and in, acknowledging enough. it and learning from it is very important. I would say so, too, as someone that's owned the 1985 Oldsmobile Delta 88, Zach, you could have hit that you could have hit that car into perpetuity, and it wouldn't have bothered me at all. So. Yeah. Oh, it it, uh, it knocked the valve cover off the Ural, um, <laughs> and, or, or bent the studs that hold the valve cover in oh, place. Yeah. It was leaking oil, and uh, Ari Henning MacGyvered a, a a gasket out of cardboard and silicone, and we made it back to Los Angeles. So yeah, the, the Ural is a, the Russian tank that kept That's on ticking. Yep. It's good yeah, having him machine. along. So let's. Uh, I, I know that Zach to wants box. to jump into the next one, but let's do a quick pause. We can get a uh, an add in for Motul, and we'll come back with even more stories. Okie doke. We are back. Um, and Spurgeon is right that I was keen to pivot to the next thing, uh, which is talking about the dirt. We said we we're going to talk about pavement. So now we're going to talk about uh, dirt riding, which I, I think we'll all raise our hand. Ari and I, anyway, raise our hand and say that we are less experienced dirt riders than we are pavement riders. But I do think we can talk about the, the sort of scope of of um, of off-road riding. And really the, the two big uh, arenas here I think are sort of trail riding and then motocross, right? You can mm-hmm. go to a, 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 an off-road track, an off-road facility and ride, or you can sort of bop through the woods and explore in a, in a dual sport capacity. So again, Ariel, we'll give you guest honors, um, knee-jerk reaction. What is safer, motocross or trail riding? Oh my goodness. I, I don't have a whole lot of experience with either. I have fallen down plenty <laughs> and the dirt is certainly softer than the pavement, but I would think that trail riding, motocross um, jumps in general, uh, I recognize as being a really good way to mess yourself up. And that's advice uh, that's firsthand experience as well as advice from people <laughs> with a lot more motocross experience with me where they're like, eventually you're going to break something because it just happens when you fall from 18 or 20 feet in the air. Uh, so yeah, knee-jerk reaction would be trail riding. And, and that's like because of trees or? In terms of more safety because there's no sorry, jumps. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, trail riding is safer, you're saying? Trail riding is I, safer because there, because there are no jumps. Gotcha. Or at least yes. not the size jumps that I've seen at Glen Helen. I miss, <laughs> I misunderstood. Yes. Okay. So Spurgeon, your knee jerk reaction. So I would say that I probably have, uh, as somebody with a 350 in the garage, um, and someone that spends, I've, I would say over the past three years, I've spent more time probably riding in the dirt than I do even on longer street rides. Um, so I am not a motocross rider. I've never been to, I've been to like a vintage motocross track, but I've never been to like a proper modern motocross track. And mm. I've hurt myself plenty out in the trails. Uh, I'm, t- I'm torn because like the reason I don't go to a motocross track is I think that you do have the potential to really damage yourself if you're if you're hitting a jump. Um, and I think that also you're throwing yourself into a situation where naturally you're going to start turning the volume up and you're going to try yeah. and keep up with everybody else. When I go out for a trail ride, like my friends and I, we all have a motto and it's just like everybody rides their own bike and it's very much like how you, I'm assuming you guys would ride on the street, um, you know, wait for us at the end of the trailhead. So you, you, you do the trail and everybody's there to help you over things. The flip side of this is I've been hurt more uh, trail <laughs> riding than any other form of motorcycling uh, mm-hmm. because of trees and rocks and trying to do stuff to keep up with your friends. Um, I'm torn, but I would say that in general, I think that off-road riding is probably safer than street riding. I don't know if that's the verses that we're doing. Um, uh, so we're, talk- I don't- we're talking about motocross and trail riding right now. Then I would say for don't, me, don't jump I'm, ahead. I'm more comfortable with trail riding, so that's where that's where I would say I, I feel right, safer right. on a trail. Yeah, I mean, but the, similar to to my argument against uh, street riding, off road riding provides a lot more obstacles. Like you said, there's there's <laughs> roots, there's rocks, there's trees, and that stuff isn't present at a motocross track. But a motocross track presents obstacles that um, uh, involve more kinetic energy, shall we say? 
Yeah, yeah, I would say Indeed. on the trail too, your your speeds are often lower. Like for trail riding, like if you're flying at 20 miles an hour through the woods, like that's a pretty good clip in some single track situations. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's it's tough, right? Because trees don't move much. They don't move well. Them. Yeah, they really don't. Yeah, they're very very stubborn. Um, but it's it's really hard to. Um, it, it is hard to. It's it's hard to defend motocross riding <laughs> um when you know when there's so much amplitude involved and but so many is, energy drinks you're going to be all hopped up on taurine <laughs> obviously and then but you're if gonna, it is a vet track if it's a vet track with smaller yep. tabletops and gentle True. whoops like yeah. where you're not going to get bucked out of the seat or, or case it and have something horrible happen then i guess that's a safer environment but yeah I, again it's just i don't have enough experience to really speak to that with any authority we should probably so explain one that thing, to people though right like so what i mean with a vet track it's usually not nearly as extreme as a modern motocross track with huge jumps and then when we're talking about trail riding we are talking about uh two track and single track trails that you would ride picture if you're familiar with mountain biking you would just ride trails through the woods is basically the two differences that we're addressing here right yeah and i i think that uh the <laughs> it is it's a well yeah i i wanted to kind of pivot and ask another question what about the um you know the the community around a motocross track right like you're you're often or you, you i would say most likely you'd be at a at a motocross track when there'd be other people there so if you do get hurt you have um you know you have some, Someone some assistance yeah yeah you, you have some you have people looking after you there there may or may not be emts in, on board or uh on the track so uh but like riding a, in, on a trail by yourself is that arguably more dangerous than going to a place where there are other people perhaps yeah you're more isolated yeah so i've pulled enough people out of the woods to know <laughs> that yes if you're if you're riding on a motocross track you have an ambulance there you you they stop the racing they stop the riding they come out they grab you they take you away um, I've been in situations already where like we've been in the middle of nowhere now I've I've knock on wood I've never been injured while I'm out by myself um, I, or I've never I've I've stumbled across people we actually came up across a person that was injured and they had one or two other people with them they went back and got their truck and we all helped lift this person into the truck and then we took them to the hospital they took them to the hospital but you are definitely more isolated and especially if you're trail riding in an area where it's not easy to get a truck to or mm -hmm. you have to get air flighted out or yep. you you are by yourself and no one's around and you're on a trail that nobody really rides like there's a lot of inherent dangers that come with that but i put that back more on much like we were talking about with the street and taking responsibility for your riding i think trail riding is very much the same way like you have to know what you're getting into you have to know what your surroundings are going to be and again highly recommend against riding solo even if you're the most mm. experienced rider you Certainly. Know, unless you have a spot right. or some kind of a tracking device you can hit in an emergency. Yeah, fair yeah, enough. Ride, I think riding, that riding with a partner is, is a good piece of advice for off roading. So if you guys had to rate going to going to a motocross track day and and you know whatever hitting hitting some doubles hitting some tabletops having a good time or riding by yourself in the woods, mm. what what would you what would be safer or more dangerous there? This is one of those do as I say, not as I do moments, uh, Zach. Where, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I I do solo. I, I ride solo in the woods. Um, I've been very for fortunate. For shame, Spurgeon Dunbar. But this goes back to I also turn the volume down. Like if I'm riding right. by myself in the woods, I'm probably riding at like 80% of what I'd be riding at if it was my friends and I out riding and trying to like keep up with one another and it sure. goes back to like i keep a, a spot tracker in my pack um now i've been out there already where uh i here's this is not so much a dangerous situation but i was out on my 1090 and i got <laughs> stuck in the mud once and i had nobody to help me pull it out so the 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 funny story i'll leave you with here is i had taken my helmet off and I set it on the ground because i was just it was so it was the middle of summer and i'm trying to pull the bike out and finally i just started it and i was like i'm just gonna I'm going to rev it, I'm going to jump the clutch, and I'm just going to push it out. It didn't push it out, I just dug it down even further. But what I didn't realize <laughs> was I had set my helmet down facing up, and when oh. I went to put my helmet on, all the roost had filled the helmet with mud, and I mean, it was like swamp <laughs> mud. So I, Bro, I will say if you, uh, if you get stuck out in the middle of the woods, turn your helmet the other way down. Uh, yeah, don't set it behind the tire. Yeah, right, bad right. idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right on. What about, you, what about you, Zach? Um, yeah. I mean, I know that you've you've had some experience with adventure bikes off road. You've had some experience with dirt bikes off road. Like, where does your preference lie? 
Well, I've I've said for a long time now that I feel fairly confident if the uh, back tire is in the air or if the front tire is in the air. When both tires are in the air, I stop feeling comfortable. I don't I don't do well with the jumping. I think it's fun. I get it, um, but I I you know that's not something that I that I adapted to early on in my motorcycling career, and I'm not particularly uh, adept. So I'd have to agree that like I just I I just feel like it's more of an attitude thing about mm-hmm. uh, riding a trail or riding a motocross track. It's just like the a trail ride to me is so recreational in nature. Um, and you're there to relax and enjoy it and have fun. And you can, you know, we all get the red mist here and there where we're like, oh, I want to try and pass my buddy or like, I'm going to make it up that hill without touching my feet or whatever. And you get yourself into a situation where you, where you dump yourself off and yeah, there are trees and stuff, but to me, trail riding really combines some of the things we were talking about on the street. Um, or, or sorry, some of the things we were talking about, the comparisons between street and track that I like, which is yes, there are trees and ravines and stuff like that. And wildlife, as you pointed out, Spurgeon, but it removes a lot of variables as far as other people and other other things that are likely to to cause you harm or 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 cause you to be in a bad situation and it it sort of like creates it it provides an environment for you to have fun and only push yourself as as much as you need to which i think is the bottom line and i think it's an important uh delineation to make too where i think i'm coming at this from an east coast perspective so i'm riding in the woods (laughs) whereas you know for somebody like yourselves or for Jen, because I know Jen does a lot of trail riding, you know, when you're out in the desert, I think the dangers are completely different. You're not worried about hitting a tree, but you're worried that if you break down in the middle of the desert and you don't have enough water with you, you're not carrying, right. you know, some kind of a, a, a yeah. toolkit, like then all of a sudden your dangers come become completely different, you know? Right. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. I, it, I, riding with a buddy either way is a good call, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it does seem like the upshot that regardless of the environment, whether it's it's in the woods or at the track or on the street or at the racetrack, that you know you have to be cognizant of the existing dangers and take responsibility for that. You can't get complacent and just think like, oh, I'm I'm at the track, so like this is a safe environment. Yeah, you have to yeah. you have to recognize what the existing dangers are and account for them. And I think that goes Very back true. to what we talked earlier about the street, right? Like you can't just go to the track day and blow it into a corner like Zach was talking and about without off. having the skill to be able to pull it in. You know, like you have to right, right. you have to ride within your skill set. True enough. So um, all of this being said, we talked about sort of four different large disciplines of motorcycle riding. We agreed that track riding on for pavement we sort of agreed is like probably a safer environment to put yourself in we 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 agreed though we admit we don't have much experience uh trail riding arguably a more um docile and safer environment to enjoy off-road so here here's my question for you guys now track day on pavement or a trail you know trail riding um what would what would your what would your like uh safety versus danger scale look like for that yeah, that's a good question. Again, I think it boils down to the to the attitude of the person participating, right? Like, if you tell me that I'm gonna do those two two experiences, those two disciplines, and like try and make them safe, then I'm gonna go slow. I'm gonna turn the volume down, like <laughs> like Spurgeon said. Right. But uh, well, you maybe more to the point, you personally, Ari Henny. So like, yeah. if someone said you could go, okay, you, uh, we got you know Tuesday is set aside for like a motorcycle time, and we can either go to a track day or. We can go on a trail ride. Uh, you know, we're going to ride all day. It's going to be super fun. Um, regardless of which one you would prefer to do, which one mm-hmm. in your head would you be thinking like, I'm probably less likely to get hurt in yeah, that situation? That would be, that would be a, a paved track day. Just, just, just because of my level of comfort and experience there and being familiar with it and, and, and knowing okay. yeah. and having experience with the things that are going to catch me out and put me on the ground. Fair enough. What about you, Spurge? I'm the exact opposite. I, at this point in, in my motorcycling career, I'm more comfortable with riding on the trail because I just do it more frequently. You know, I... I, on average, was was at the track twice a year. It was something I enjoyed doing, but it wasn't something that I was there every weekend practicing. Whereas with my trail riding, like, I'm pretty much out, you know, if not every weekend, every other weekend uh, trail riding at this point. So that's where my comfort level just lies. And I think it gets back to, you know, what Ari just said. Like, it really comes down to what kind of, you know, riding you're most comfortable with and your ability in doing that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to think what I would say. Um I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's a, I don't know if there's a, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to really just isolate the safety well, let, well, and danger aspect of it. Like which one, if you, if you were going to, if you imagine yourself, uh, you know, taking a tumble in which scenario would you be? I guess it would be a pavement track day. That's yeah, the, I, I think that would be safer. I, I would totally. just be more, maybe it's because I'm more comfortable, but I feel like the, the chances of me 
tuck in the front in the middle of a corner or like sliding sliding off and being okay. The chances of I'll take that over going over the handlebars on a trail ride or like tipping over and having the bike land on me or whatever, you know, like, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I agree. I think the scenario is the, I think with our, 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 uh, our resume of crashing, there's like, <laughs> there's, there's very specific buckets of how you're going to crash on the track. Right. right? right. And the, the yep. worst scenario is perhaps impacting getting into a tangle with someone else. But second right. to that is high siding. And then like all the low siding scenarios are pretty innocuous. Yeah. Yeah. In large part, in large part, definitely. But let me, let me ask yeah, you this. So, cause like I've, I've only ever high sided off road and I've, and it, and it really wakes you up, but I've never high sided on the racetrack, um, <laughs> on the street. It. <laughs> but my question for you is that you had made a comment earlier, Zach, about like when you're, and, and to your point, you too, Ari, where when you're on the track, you're riding on the fringe, right? Like you're trying to find that level of where to push your, your ability just a little bit more than you did the time before. Do yeah. you go into a track ride the same way that you went into a trail ride? So if I, if, if you came out here and I gave you a spare 350 and we went out for a trail ride together, would you attack it the same way that you attack a track day? No, I wouldn't. No. And I'm guessing I would say the same thing. Yeah. It's a totally different experience. I mean, in yeah. my mind, a trail walk is a mountain bike ride where I don't have to pedal. Like I'm out there to enjoy nature. I'm out there to like explore technicality a little bit and hang out with my friends, so, which is, yeah. a, is a totally different experience than going to a yeah. track day. And I, 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 but I, but I will say that when I go to a track day on a, on a, on, you know, on a, on a sport bike or something like that, I, I, I also, I spend some time uh, you know, pushing the limit, but I also spend some time enjoying myself and, and having a similar outlook as I do on a trail ride, you know, where I'm, I'm going through corners and I'm leaning on the tire and I have my knee on the ground and I try to, I'm riding at a pace where I can look around figuratively and say, I'm having fun. This is great. I, I enjoy this experience and it's not like, ah, yeah, I'm like not, I might fold the front focus. Yeah, exactly. All the exactly. Time. Whereas a race, you know, a race would be a whole different thing. If someone said, Oh, you're going to go do a hair scramble or you're going to do, go do a road race. I would just feel like so much more confident on the pavement because I would, you know, a hair scramble. I would, I would be like, there's like a 70, 30 chance I hit, I hurt myself <laughs> uh, because I'm, I don't, I just, I'm so, I just don't have the same skill set. That's all. So. Um, so yeah, I think, I think this is, it, it, it sounds, it's all very personal. It's all kind of to do with the attitude of the, yeah. of the person. Um, uh, I guess I, I would like to come back and, and make a statement that you guys can, you feel free to disagree with. Uh, but I think based on all of the factors, um, access budget, that kind of thing. If someone, if a super safety conscious person came to me and said like, I want to try motorcycling, but I just, I want to be. I'm, I'm like nervous about it and I just want to be the safest I can possibly be. I do think I would say a small dirt bike in a, a wide open area or, e- or even, even trails, whatever, just something 100%. like that. That would be my suggestion. Yeah, that's always the recommended place for people to start, right? Like a little, a little 85 or 100 in a big dirt parking lot or some open expanse where there's not a lot to run into and just let them get comfortable. Right. Yeah, I agree. Or if you're if you're Spurgeon Dunbar Senior, you say, "All right, son, here's the CR250. This is how the clutch works." I wish my dad Jesus. would have done that. My Good dad, luck. My dad was like, my dad was very much the "do as I say, not as I do" father. Where it's like he had motorcycles the whole time I was growing up. And then as soon as I got an interest in him, he was like, no, they're dangerous. You can't have one. Um, so it <laughs> took me a while to get around that. But I did want to say this. So like uh, one of the questions that I had that I wanted to kind of wrap this up with, because I know we're kind of getting to the end of this discussion, would be. And I, and I think my thoughts have changed on what I was going to say based on how this conversation has gone. Do you think that there is a safe motorcycle to start with, right? Like, I think a lot of times people are like, well, that motorcycle is, is dangerous for beginners. Do you think that that's true? Do you think that there's certain motorcycles specifically that are more dangerous than others? I think I think a CR250 two-stroke from the 90s is probably or, a pretty dangerous <laughs> or an S1000 double R. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think the the basic chart there is uh, performance, you know, like the uh, the faster a bike is, the worse idea it is for someone who's new to ride it. Is that accurate? Well, I yeah, mean, and I would also say I would say weight as well to some degree. Yeah, so interesting. You said S1000 double R, like what would you not could the argument not be made that the S1000 double R has such sophisticated rider aids that that would actually be a safer bike to ride for certain people? Yeah. I mean if it's going from 0 to 60 in just a couple seconds, ABS isn't going to keep you from hitting a brick wall. So what about it's what just, about it's the argument? It's too much power and performance for someone that doesn't know how to handle it even with electronics. I guess what about the argument that, you know, 
we had talked about earlier with personal accountability, right? Like if, if this is a person that doesn't pull back on the throttle and go whack it wide open, like does that make the bike more dangerous? Do you blame it on the bike or do you blame it on the rider? Um, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a weird overlap in the Venn diagram of yes, personal responsibility and restraint, but having access to that sort of power uh, people are going to want to explore it. And, and yeah. I mean, I was riding motorcycles for a very long time before I ever felt comfortable on a leader bike. Like my, my early days at motorcyclist magazine, I remember the first time they put me on a thousand and in the back of my mind, I could just hear my dad being like, Oh man, those things wheelie really uncontrollably. It's going to spit you off. And I mean, even after I'd been riding for years and years, I was still, I had so much respect for an open class bike. And I think that's, you know, that can get hammered into you by people on forums, by your friends, and hopefully that'll keep you safe, but it's just not a good idea. Yeah, I don't think I, I. I don't know if this. I don't know if this is gonna play. Bear with me. But I think the whole like a, a sharper knife is actually safer doesn't apply in mm. in motorcycling. Like it, it's not it's not the sophistication of the tool that that helps people be safe. It just having just having a less power, just having less power in your hands, figuratively and literally, Correct. is a better environment. It it yep. it it limits the size of the bad decision you can make yeah. the um, potential the potential is is reduced in a big yeah. way yeah well yeah i, I remember my, my dad told me a story uh years ago about um uh you know a, a bike i forget what the two bikes were um but he did have one of those kawasaki h1 um uh 500, 500 cc triple. Yeah, two-stroke triple, which was uh, sort of like a, a famously fast and affordable bike in the early late sixties, early seventies. Widowmaker. And he had a bike. Wasn't that the? I Wid- think the, the Widowmaker was actually H two. The H two okay, yeah. was the seven fifty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But anyway, the H one was a, a still a, a quite a high performance bike of of the time, and um, and I remember him saying that he had ridden a bike before that. I don't remember what his bike was before, but he had he had this anecdote where he sort of like pulled away from this stop sign on a, on an empty road or something like that on his way to work or whatever it was. And he would like, give it, give, give it the beans, you know, for whatever, five seconds, 10 seconds. And he would like accelerate and be like, ah, this is fun. I'm riding a motorcycle. And then he, you know, when he got, when he got past the, when he, where he stopped, he was like, okay, I'm rolling out of the throttle now after say eight seconds of being on the throttle wide open, he would look down and he was going 55, 60 miles an hour. And then when he got that other bike, he would do this. If he went the same thing, you know, he was like, oh, I'm commuting to work. I'm doing a thing. I'm getting on the gas. And I'm like, oh, I'm revving it up and I'm going to go do this for, and then he looked down and he was going 85 or 90 miles yeah. an hour. And that's the thing that people don't, I think, appreciate is that you, when you do have those moments of like, oh, I'm just going to like cut loose and you catch a little crazy hair. That's when having 40 horsepower is so much better than having 140 horsepower. Yeah, I, that's I, a that's a great explanation. One second at wide open throttle on an S one thousand double R between one second at wide open throttle on a CB five hundred is right. Big drastically different experience. <laughs> I, the one thing that I do, yeah. I know we weren't going to talk about statistics or anything, but the reason that I mentioned that when you had mentioned the S one thousand double R, and I do agree with you in the fact that like if we were going to take somebody that had never ridden on a racetrack before and there was no instruction involved, and you were going to say here's a Ninja four hundred or here's a you know ZX ten R. Um, I do think that they'd probably have a a more enjoyable experience on the Ninja 400. But I know when I had talked to Dylan Code, um, who runs California Superbike School, they had actually seen the amount of their crashes reduced when they switched to the S1000RR versus, I think they were using ZX7s. ZX6s. ZX6s before that. No ABS, no TC. Exactly. So that that was the only point that I was trying to make. And I do think that's a specific example of a school in a closed course. Um, But in that case, you know, the... The rider aids were helping because when people do get out of control, that it just helped to keep everything in perspective a little bit. Right, right. Um, yep. So I got two more things I want to I want to touch on. One is let's remove horsepower from the discussion, and say just the size of the bike. Is 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 a smaller bike always better? Yes Not or no. In a crosswind. <laughs> okay. So let, like, but what, but what, you know, what are some things people should be thinking about? Like, are there, are like, I know I've been on bikes that have been small enough that I'm like, I feel vulnerable now. Yes. Like, if it's merging so, onto if the it's highway. So small, yeah, right. If it's right. so small that it can't keep pace with traffic or get out of its own way, then I feel like that's a danger. But generally speaking, a lighter bike is going to be easier to handle. You're less likely to have some embarrassing incident where you fall over in a parking lot or, <laughs> or have some other issue. It's just, you're just going to feel more confident. You're going to feel like you have more control over it uh, versus a really large motorcycle, which, you know, this, they can be hard to handle. They're they're not going to stop as well. They're not going to steer as well. Hundred uh, percent. If it does fall over, you're going to struggle to pick it up. So why is it then that sometimes when you're on a big bike, you sort of feel 
safer. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, that's that's a bit of a stretch, but you know what I mean. When you sometimes you ride a big bike and you think like, yeah, I feel, it feels substantial and it feels like I it feels I, stable, I have right? Yeah. Some presence it's, it's on the stability. road, maybe. Like, what is that? Uh, well, yeah? I think it, it depends on whether or not you're trying to uh, pedal the bike around a parking lot. Um, or you're trying yeah. to just cruise down the highway at 70 miles an hour. Because I do agree with you. I think that there's a stability factor of a street glide when you're rolling down the highway where it feels more planted. You don't feel you're getting blown around a lot. But that same stability factor comes to bite you in the ass when you are trying to navigate that around <laughs> uh, you know, a city street or a parking lot. Right, right. Yeah. Weight, yeah. weight is to your benefit once you're once you're moving and you've got some inertia and momentum, but otherwise it's it's kind of plays against you, especially yeah. at slower speeds. And I just want to go back to the track or to not the track, <laughs> to the off road, you know, trail. I want to go back thing. to the track too. No, but we all do. <laughs> I mean, we'd all be rather 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 there right now. But I would say that, like for me, I get the question a lot because I have owned adventure bikes, and that was been such a big part of my life over the past you know six years and i recently i more recently got a a 350 so i started off road on an adventure bike and then kind of went down to the rational way of doing it which was having a 350 um and i still like riding those bikes off road for different reasons but i would say that if we were doing big versus small an adventure bike can easily get away from you and hurt you a lot more than a than a small dirt bike can even just yep. the tip over factor in my in my own experience <laughs> of just struggling to hold up a 600 pound adventure bike uh, as as not being a particularly tall guy like you, you know it, once it gets off a few degrees of lean you're kind of just screwed and you have to acquiesce and let the thing fall over and then a- wait for your buddy to help you pick it up <laughs> and that totally. probably doesn't happen a lot on a 275 pound dirt bike well the other thing yeah. too is if, if for people that are getting onto the adventure bikes i had done a, an off-road training school the one time and the hardest thing for people to break that grew up on dirt bikes was they go to stick their leg out and the instructor was like dude you're just gonna break your leg like if your adventure bike starts to go over you're not kicking it yeah. back up you know no nope, right, right. just, <laughs> let, it just let it go yeah i remember i remember getting a tip from someone um riding adventure bikes one time um they were we were going down this kind of like sandy road um and uh and they were standing up a lot and i, th- I was thought this is like you can sit down it's not like it's bumpy you're like it's fine you know um and i asked why they were standing up so much and they said because when i'm standing up i won't put my leg out and the saddlebag won't hit it hmm. and yep. i was like huh that's an interesting thing that i didn't really put together but you're more you're so much more likely to stick your leg out right I mean, if you're sitting it's down an yeah. and then there's that aluminum saddlebag behind that's gonna ugh, like take your leg off or whatever so they're just like i'm gonna stand up so i can't I won't make option. that decision. Yeah, which yeah. is uh, pretty smart, I think. Interesting strategy. Um, yeah. So, last question that I would like to put to the group for this particular podcast is: <laughs> Is there, Ari Henning and Spurgeon Dunbar, is there a dangerous ride that you've always wanted to take? Is there, or or a dangerous a, a experience in motorcycling that you've always thought like, well, that's like kind of a sketchy thing to do on a motorcycle, but man, that always sounds like fun, like the globe of death, or like I don't know, any road trip or whatever. Anything come to mind? The globe of death. That's good. That, I mean, you know, hey, that that's too scary for me. I mean, you watch yeah. that and it's just it makes uh, me dizzy just sketchy. just witnessing it. I what about I, so I'll, there's the there's the globe of death and then there's the wall of death or there's a, I don't know if they're called the same thing. But no, there's no, no, the no, globe and then the globe is when it's like three people and they're crossing paths. It's the middle totally, totally. mesh work and then the wall of death is the old circus thing where they right. basically go around on an Indian no hands. Totally. Honestly, neither one of those is that appealing to me. The globe. <laughs> Because it's terrifying in the wall of death, I'm like, I don't know. I've I've been around the banking at the Conti Drome. Like that was <laughs> that was plenty fun. I think as far as uh, bucket list things that a lot of people would deem dangerous is 200 mile an hour club. Like I'd like to go 200 miles nice. an hour. Nice. Yeah, which isn't that far off with a lot of modern bikes, but you just you want need to do it long it, enough. You want to do it with a buddy? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a. We're not going to reveal it, but we've got a, a an, yeah. an episode idea that does involve two people going 200 miles an hour. But yeah, I would say that was it. I don't want to. I don't want to race the Isle of Man. I don't want to race Pikes Peak. Uh, those are frankly just too dangerous for me. But the you know going 200 miles an hour would be, be pretty fun. I like that. I, I share that goal. 100%. That's what about you, Spurgeon? What about you, Spurgeon? You gotta, mine, mine is not 200 miles an hour. Mine goes back to like if you remember, uh, I think it was last season we had done a uh, an episode about. Um, like different trips that we would want to take and my danger comes into i want to do south america and like i want to do it on trails i don't want to go down and ride south america on you know roads and uh, you know every now and then if you and you can google this there's like all the kinds of videos where it's like you know one plank over like a cliff and you have to get your bike over the like (laughs) to the point where you watch it and you're just like oh and like your your heart starts pounding just watching the video um but like that's probably what i would that's probably if I was going to put myself in a dangerous situation, I'd be in South America trying to get a KLR 650 over a plank. <laughs> mm. What about that? That road? I forget what the road's called. I feel like it's called like the 
the death road or something like that but that's that a crazy india? no well, it's in, yeah it's yeah it's in, india. India. it's in no it's in india it's in, the one where it's like a that, straight that super high pass yeah that super high yeah. pass that, there's one in that, south america that i'm thinking of it's in like peru or argentina or chile or something like okay. that where yeah, there's I, like I think the I can visualize it. It's just crazy sheer cliff. cliff. Yeah, yeah. And there's vehicles trying to like pass each other, and there's just yeah, not yeah. enough room. And they're like, anyway, there's like, yeah. there's like buses and tractor trailer truck type trucks, and I'm just like, eh, eh. I would so actually, sketchy. I would actually rather do that on a motorcycle because you've seen the pictures of the cars where like the cars can't get around oh and they have God. to back all yeah. the way up until they get. I would rather if I had to do that road, I would rather be on a motorcycle. Well, I can just hug. You can tuck in somewhere. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. But yeah, some of that, some of that stuff. Just is terrifying, but I, I would say that that would be my answer. You guys can go so 200 would, miles an hour. I'll go 15 miles an hour off of a cliff. <laughs> and so that would be that that trail riding in South America. Would that be all the way from the U.S. down to Tierra del Fuego? Are you talking about this epic world adventure? Or no, I would. Is there a specific area? I you would love ride? to just do South America. Like I've done Baja. I've done the entire length of Baja, and like I would like to get a small group of people. Um, maybe we do it as some big episode of something where we all go down together, but I would just love to do an exploration of, you know, you start in America and you go all the way down to the, to the tip of, of South America and you, you see the jungles, you, you, you ride through and you basically survive it. But yeah. <laughs> cool. We just, need to, we just need to clear our schedules for the next three or four months. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Summer vacay. Cool. Well, that's a, I, uh, that, that was good. That was good. Uh, good discussion. I hope that we fairly covered, comprehensive. No, I think so. I hope that we covered some things that people were uh, curious about, or at least entertained by. Um, I feel like that was a that was a good sort of mulling over of this this thing, this sort of uh, dark cloud that ho- that um, hovers over motorcycling to a certain extent, which is the the danger and the risk of it. But um, yeah, hopefully it got your motorcycling mind thinking about those things, and I had fun in this discussion. That's for sure. Maybe if uh, if we leave you with anything, it's that some of the dangers of motorcycling can be avoided um, if we, you know, put a little bit more responsibility back on ourselves and the way that we ride. Wow. And, you know, if you're going to use a track day, go to a track day to improve your skills and then take those skills to the road and improve your riding on both ends of the spectrum. Excellent advice. Indeed. All right. Well, uh, the, the rest of this is all bureaucracy and paperwork and you don't want to hang out for this area so we can send you on your way but i do appreciate you hanging out with us today that was a lot of fun always a pleasure talking bikes with you guys thanks for having me <laughs> see, Ari. see ya oh, thank god ari has gone now we can get on to what you really want to hear which is your comments that we read uh, out loud i mean it this is just obviously the highest octane part of the of the show <laughs> This is High Side, Low Side Comments. We take these from um, from YouTube, from Apple iTunes, anywhere you can leave a comment. We read them, believe it or not. And uh, we appreciate those of you who contribute because this uh, section of the show is pretty fun, we think. So first one I'm going to tackle, if that's okay, Spurge McGurge. Take it um, away. First one is from Charles, who says, please have Jen Dunstan back as a formal apparel designer and perhaps some product people from other companies to answer apparel design questions. So Charles wants Jen back because she worked in product design. Uh, we want Jen back for many of other many other reasons. She's, she's great. Um, Charles' question specifically this time was, why the hell does summer gear uh, like jackets have black panels on the shoulders and arms? We're roasting in the sun. So basically, like, why would why would a mesh jacket designed to keep you cool be black? What the heck is what's the deal with that? This is what Charles wants to know, and I'm gonna let Spurgeon answer. Because they sell ten to one to any other color. <laughs> so I mean, that's really yes. what this comes down to. Like, I get that. Like, in theory, you shouldn't wear black because it absorbs heat but like i mean a black leather jacket looks cool and you wear it even if it's hot out in the summertime that's what sells maybe spurgeon people are only buying the black ones because they only make the black ones what do you say to that there's plenty of different color options out there in mesh jackets (laughs) i think like revit for example does like browns and they do grays uh, yeah. you're, I'm thinking like off the top of my head, climb has all kinds of like high vis and blues and grays. Like sure. there's all these, and I'm just, I'm just throwing those two out there cause that's what I'm familiar sure. with. But like black yeah. typically is the bigger seller. Yeah. So, so, so Charles, that is the answer. Unfortunately, same reason, um, for you, um, uh, for those of you out there wondering about women's gear and why it's always pink and like, what the heck is the whole like pink it and shrink it thing? Like this such BS. Like, and I've heard, uh, you know, female riders say like, I don't want a pink helmet. I don't want a pink jacket. Why is it always pink? Unfortunately, the answer is the same. They sell a lot of the pink versions of those things and that's why they make them. For what it's worth, I saw this pink pair of Alpine stars off-road boots and they did not make them <laughs> yeah, for, for me. 
I yeah. am raising my hand as a, a, a gentleman of high side, low side, saying that if Alpine Stars wants to make a pair of Tech 7 Enduros and like a fluorescent pink, I will buy that shit. <laughs> Word. Well, I mean, he won't buy it. No, no. I mean, you know. I mean, I'll get it for free when I call up our Alpine <laughs> Stars rep and say I want to wear a pair of these. So, All yeah. right. <laughs> Enough of that. Um, so... Uh, yeah, that is a that is that is the answer to that question, Charles. Unfortunately, and um, uh, we hope that helps. We will have Jen back on the podcast at some point, and um, we'll try to gather some of those product questions. So if you have more, send them our way. Um, any and all people, Charles and and the other three people that listen to this podcast, please do send those uh, questions along. Yeah, um, but that's that's the answer. Hopefully that that satisfies your curiosity, Charles. I, and I wouldn't even say it's unfortunate, Charles. I mean, there are plenty of options out there if you if you don't want the uh, the black options. So yeah. I, there's a lot of different yeah. uh, designs for you to choose from. So let's move on to high side, low side. Comment to this is Doug. I feel like Doug. I got some, we got some easy names this time. So Doug <laughs> wrote in and said. Hey, all. Uh, I was reading the news and saw that the big four, Yamaha, Honda, Suzuki, Kawasaki, have agreed to make swappable electric batteries. Um, I remember hearing one on one of your podcasts about uh, KTM and Piaggio joining forces about swappable batteries. We actually did. Yeah, we actually yeah, talked yeah, about the big four, too. Um, but he you know, wants to know, what's the future of this? Um, what do we think about this update of swappable batteries? And yeah. is this something we should keep you know, discussing about in the future? I will talk about it, Doug, when some move, something happens. It's a great idea, and it's, it's it's exciting. I think we can all agree. But what I'm like, let's do it already. Or you know, it, it we can all you know hold hands and sing kumbaya in a press release. That's easy. But put some <laughs> batteries, some swappable batteries, on showroom floors. Am I right, Doug? Uh, so that's we 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 would also love to to have an update in a future show about swappable batteries because we do think it's a cool idea. But I, I'm not ready to talk about it yet. For, Let's do for it the record, already. for the record, I think it's the only way that electric vehicles are going to succeed in America. I was talking to, I actually have a friend, Keith, who lives in LA and was on his way to work. He has a, he has a Harley Davidson live wire. I should say had a Harley Davidson live wire. And <laughs> he, the, 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 oh, I guess the mileage uh, meter said that he had enough time to get to work. He actually ran out of battery juice, had to pull over, had to charge, had to wait 45 minutes and was subsequently an hour late to work whereas if he would have been able to pull over swap out a battery at a swappable charging station swap in a new yeah. battery much like we do at a gas station he could have kept kept going um so i think to doug so wait, wait, wait whoa, hold on hold on hold on what happened to keith's live wire uh, he traded it in on a bmw r1250 gs is what the last that i heard so it was uh, it, that was the last choice, time that was, the, that was the last time that the live wire let him down um, <laughs> but yeah, i that's I, yeah I would say ahead, that sorry. we no, we've we've just covered this in high side, low side as a news piece. But the, the fact of the matter is, to Zach's point, until someone's actually going to put these in production, we really have nothing to say about it. Yeah. Try. So and I I I'm I I feel for Keith, man. Cause I I'm not gonna say a live wire is better than an R twelve fifty GS, but a live wire is a great bike. And it's sad that he gave up on it for that reason, because it's sort of stabbed in the back. But it's it, anyway. if you're ripping around the city and you're living in LA and you're trying to lane split and you're trying to just get around a live wire potentially is a better bike for that kind of riding yeah, if you don't have to worry about running out of juice and being stranded on the 405. Yes, true enough. Okay, um, last um, comment question is from Kelly, who specifies um, that he is a guy, which is fair enough, I suppose. Um, Kelly, uh, let's see, this is a long comment. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, but Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong, Spurge, um, is an ex motor cop or he knows his friends with a, a motor cop. I think he just has a lot of opinions. He's been talking, he's been talking to, he's <laughs> so been, been talking, talking to a local to motorcycle cop. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Kelly's doing research. Appreciate that Kelly. Um, and basically wants to talk about how the Pan America will be the saving grace of Harley Davidson, not because it will sell well to the public, but because it will go uh, further to earn government contracts for police vehicles because in Kelly's uh, research talking to, to police officers, perhaps being one, I kind of forget to be honest, um, it, he realized or you know has learned that a lot of police departments are trading uh, old Har old air-cooled Harleys um, or even showerhead Harleys in on um, BMW RTs. Um, and one of the things that he said he learned was that um, the, the BMWs require less maintenance, they require less money. Um, they're also they perform better, they're faster, um, and uh, that's why the police departments want them. And why wouldn't they want a Pan America? And I think this is a fantastic, I think this is a very, very astute observation. I think 
police departments should want Pan Americas for their police bike. It's a great police bike as far as I can tell. I think if you're looking at the fact that you don't have to worry about the maintenance of a, you know, drivetrain, um, you can really yep. just, you know, go in there, fire it up and roll. It's going to be a lot more agile. Uh, sorry, sorry. Just to be clear, uh, you don't have to worry about maintenance of the valve train. Valves, valve train. Sorry, valve train. My bad. Yes. Um, drivetrain, obviously, <laughs> it is much like we talked about earlier in the episode. You should grab some Motul lube and just you just hose <laughs> that drivetrain down at the end. Um, <laughs> But no, I do think that like from a maintenance standpoint, from an agility standpoint, like if you had to say, hey, you're going to go pursue a bad guy on either a street glide or a Pan America, I know Uh, which one that I'm going for. So I do think it has a lot of advantages for that, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And and I I hope that Harley succeeds with the Pan America in uh, many facets, whether it's government contracts or people buying them. But I think that that's a really, really astute thing to say, Kelly. And I appreciate your your comment. I have a question for you. So don't doesn't the don't the police in in Southern California and maybe it's like a specific beach area, but don't they use um, Africa Twins as pursuit bikes? Uh, Redondo Beach PD, I believe um, they have a couple of Africa Twin police yeah. bikes, but that's not like a uh, as, as far as I understand it, that's not a a that has sunk super thing. deep. In, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think there there are lots of. Um, police departments that have like there's a i don't know if it was long beach pd or someone had an s1000 double r police bike like you know a pursuit police bike or whatever i think it was a kind of a shtick honestly it, probably because they have too much budget but anyway the point is um they 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 occasionally do oddball police bikes as a sort of an exercise or even even like kind of a pr thing um which is cool and you know i wouldn't want to try and outrun an s1000 double r that's for sure uh but uh, but no there's there's i don't think there's like a super uh, large fleet of, of Africa twins, but that is something that they experimented with. I do think I, adventure bikes in general would be good police bikes. I, I agree with you. I think adventure bikes and police bikes would be uh, it, it all, in an all around fashion, a better pursuit bike than an S 1000 RR given, you know, all the different you know situations you might get yourself into. But yeah, I, certainly I do remember reading somewhere and maybe I'm wrong with this, or maybe if there's any Ohio listeners out there outside of Lance Oliver, who I know listens to this. Um, <laughs> but I heard that Ohio was actually using Hayabusa's for a while for Whoa. pursuing uh, on, on like highway chases. So maybe I'm wrong with that, but if anybody out there is listening and you reside in Ohio or you can give us an authoritative answer, I would love to know if the state of Ohio is still using Suzuki Hayabusa's as uh, police bikes in their fleet. Yeah, hard to imagine that uh, Hayabusa would do a better job than a chopper, but maybe. A Hayabusa might be faster than a chopper, actually, right? I don't know. I don't know. If enough, I don't know enough about choppers. <laughs> the point is, um, thank you, Get the Kelly, chopper. for your for your <laughs> for your comment, and um, and I hope that that uh, that it comes to fruition to to a certain extent. That would be fun to see. So, if you want to have your high side, low side uh, comment read on the air, go ahead and you can either uh, send us an email to highsidelowside at revzilla.com. You can leave it on the YouTube comments below the video if you're watching this on the video. And as always, you can uh, you can leave us an Apple iTunes review. Now, we're not likely going to read your Apple iTunes review uh, out loud in this final section, but we will read it out loud in the beginning when we're giving away free t-shirts. True enough. And just as a friendly, very extremely, the, the friendliest reminder... Um, Dante's Scorpio 007 and SB Painter, you are um, the winners of the t-shirts for this uh, podcast, just in case you fell asleep early on and you're just waking up. Um, send us an email to highsidelowside at revzilla.com with your size and your address so that we can give you a free t-shirt. Zach, I think we've successfully talked about the dangers of motorcycling. We talked about the news. We talked about we talked about the dangers of leaving an iTunes review and getting a free T-shirt. It's it's really perilous. So, I think <laughs> from us at High Side Low Side to you out there in listener land, I think we're ready to say I do. Absolutely. If you accidentally tuned into High Side Low Side, thanks for sticking around this long. <laughs> and we will see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.